Okay, we're, today we're doing week eight for New Testament theology, and we're going to be focusing on the Gospel of Matthew, our second gospel that we, we're studying in this series of the, on the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, so let's begin our class with a word of prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we, we again thank you so much for all the ways you work in our lives and for giving us the gift of Jesus Christ and for the testimonies we have in Scripture that point to Him, that record His teachings, that help us know You, know Him, and, and just grow and develop in our own relationship with You and our spiritual lives. We pray now that as we study the book of Matthew today, that this will be a very helpful, informative, challenging, meaningful time of study, and that not only will we learn academically and intellectually, but we also pray that your Holy Spirit will be speaking through this material to build up each one of us. And so we believe all these things are your will, and so we thank you for what you're going to do ahead of time. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin by covering some key background information which you can find in your guide. And the first point relates to the purpose in its context. The number one purpose for this gospel is to build up the church. And whereas Mark certainly had a context that we talked about in terms of being in Rome and probably addressing the church there and disciples who wanted to understand more about who Jesus was and about how to handle a difficult situation. What does it mean to follow Jesus and to be a disciple of Christ? Matthew seems to be not so concerned with those issues as much as he's concerned with clarifying who, what is the church and what and how is the church need to, how does the church understand itself? How should the church understand itself? And so we could imagine that it's, it's a bit like a catechism. Catechism is simply a, a summary of the principles of the Christian faith. And it's usually in the format of a question and an answer. A question and an answer, a question and an answer. Well, we don't have a lot of questions in Matthew, but we have a lot of answers. And so what, what, what I think is implied here by calling it a, a type of pre-catechetical information or, 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 or document is that we can assume that Matthew is anticipating questions or, or he's raising questions that need to be answered and he's providing the answers in his, the way he tells the story and the way he structures his gospel. As I've said to you before, uh, even when studying Paul's epistles, but certainly also for the Gospels. We should not just think about these as a history book. But there's always a pastoral concern because there's a real community behind uh, this Gospel. Matthew's writing to someone. And it's notoriously difficult for us to recover the original context. The scholars write many, many pages trying to determine, well, maybe it was this group, maybe it was that group. Maybe it was a Jewish group, maybe it was a Gentile group. And there's always arguments on both sides, and the arguments go on and on. And the truth is, we can't finally answer those questions definitively. But we can identify pastoral concern. We can identify the messages uh, in, on many different levels. And so, the very end of this gospel in Matthew 28, verse 20, the very last verse, ends this way. Jesus has just issued the great uh, commission that we'll talk about later. And he says, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is reassurance. Those who have heard the gospel, accepted the gospel, now we don't know 40, 50, 60, uh, maybe not 60, uh, 50 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, maybe they're experiencing some persecution as Christians everywhere have experienced it one time or another. 
uh, they need reassurance. And so here's where we get some of our Christology from Matthew, just in this, this last sentence, I am with you always at the end of the age. One of the questions that I've found difficult to answer as a New Testament theologian is, what's the difference between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit? Well, we know Jesus Christ was a human being, and the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us since Christ went to heaven. But the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ, according to Paul. And you know from the Baptist tradition, at least many Baptist traditions, is that to become a Christian, you, you're supposed to accept somebody into your heart. Who do you accept in your heart? Do you do that in your Baptist tradition? Do you talk about accepting Jesus as your Savior? Do you do, talk about that in Myanmar? Yes. Okay, good. good. I'm looking for yeses and nods. Yes here. Otherwise, I, I don't know where I am. <laughs> no, not in the Anglican tradition? No. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Well, but my point is, I've often asked myself the question, if we accept Jesus Christ in, in our hearts, but Jesus is in heaven and the Holy Spirit is here, shouldn't we say we accept the Holy Spirit in our heart? But no, that's never been our tradition. We've, we've always talked about accepting Christ. Well, we don't have time to totally talk about that today, but I just do that as an introduction to say that Jesus Christ is the center of each, every gospel. He's the point of the gospel, every gospel. And though he's pictured in Acts as ascending into heaven and the Spirit comes in his place, still the church has always interpreted that the coming of the Spirit is the coming of the Spirit of Christ with us. So when we accept Jesus Christ, we are accepting his role as our Savior. So he has to be named. The Holy Spirit didn't save us. It was Jesus Christ who died on the cross. But we're also receiving into ourselves the Spirit of Christ. And so it is correct to say that Jesus Christ is in your heart. You can say that in your, in your spirit. And it's also correct to say that the Holy Spirit is in you. And they're not two different beings. You know, the, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and God the Father are one in, in a way that we can't fully understand. And so here is, is one of those very few references where... I believe a biblical writer makes clear that, yes, Jesus is still with us. Wherever heaven is, and we don't think it's outer space anymore, but wherever that is, in some unseen place, Jesus Christ is present with us. And so it is right and good for you to say and to pray to Jesus. Thank Him for being with you. Call on His name and ask Him to guide you. That's biblical. And, and Matthew is one of the first to affirm it. All right, that's background. That's off, really off of our main subject, but it is as part of the Christology of Matthew. The purpose is to give answers and principles that answer questions people are answering, asking, reassurance that Jesus is with us always. And then thirdly, there's an exhortation in the face of libertine or lawless teachers. Now, just take a look at some of that so that you get an idea of what I'm really talking about here. In chapter 7, verses 15 through 23, here we have this warning of Jesus. Uh, who, Newton, would you read these verses for us? Matthew 7, 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets who, came, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are... Revenous wolf. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistle? In the same way, very good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will know them by their fruits. Okay. Going. Uh, not everyone who, say, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many deeds of power in your name? 
Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evil doer. Okay, thank you. Now, we don't really know the context here. I mean, we don't know the context. And so this is always a challenge for us in New Testament interpretation. Who is he talking about? Who are these false prophets? Is he talking about Jewish people trying to draw the Christians back to the Jewish faith, as Paul was concerned about? Well, really, Paul was not so concerned about that. Paul was concerned about Judaizers. That's Jewish Christians who are trying to get Christians to follow uh, the Jewish customs, like, like uh, um, circumcision and things like that. But who's, who's Matthew talking about? Well, we don't know, but presumably the, the audience, the addressees, knew. And so Matthew is putting into the, word, into the mouth of Jesus a warning probably about somebody in their own community, in their own day. That seems like the most simple and logical explanation. And again, it's not to say that Jesus didn't say these exact words, but Matthew has chosen them and, and put them here in his text, certainly because he thinks they have application to his present day community and, uh, in uh, wherever he is. And, and so this gives us an idea about what life might have been like in the church context, wherever this was in the first century. That although the churches were established by some evangelist, some apostle perhaps, the church baptized believers, probably picked elders and, and deacons and, and, and was functioning as a church. But at the same time, there were, there were false teachers, false prophets, he calls them. Presumably, who also call themselves Christians or followers of Jesus Christ. And so Matthew is saying through the words of Jesus that there will be false prophets coming. And we should evaluate the people who speak to us and not just accept their teaching just because they are Christian, quote unquote, or just because they're religious leaders. Is there good fruit that comes from them, he says. Um, because not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's his way of saying those who do not adhere to the true gospel and presumably those who don't adhere to Matthew's version of the true gospel are not going to be accepted by Jesus Christ at the end of time. And so this is the context of Matthew, answering questions, reassuring believers, but also warning them against uh, false prophets. That's all part of building up the church. A second broad purpose is to clarify and reinforce community priorities, which is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'll put this up on the screen too. Very well-known verses that are often quoted. But this version, New Revised Standard Version says, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Uh, righteousness is a way of life for Matthew. Uh, and Matthew's thinking is very Jewish. And uh, this is not in contradiction to Paul. Paul's Jewish too. But Matthew is one of the most explicitly, clearly Jewish thinking writers in the New Testament. And uh, many people think his audience was Jewish, although it's, that's debated. So when you hear the term righteousness in Matthew, think about right living. Now, from Paul's perspective, when you hear the word righteousness, what do you think about? Put you on the spot here, but it's usually he thinks about, we, we think about our forgiveness, and our, our right standing with God because of the work of Jesus Christ. So we're saved by grace through faith. And then that gets applied to Paul's teaching of righteousness that we are made righteous in God's eyes through Christ. And so for many Christians, especially in the evangelical tradition, uh, which some of you are from, is that uh, we think of righteousness as being right before God. But for Matthew, 
certainly righteousness is being right before God, but righteousness comes from concretely following the way of God, doing the right thing. It's very behavioral, very concrete. And so the question that we should be asking as readers is what does it mean in practice to seek first God's kingdom and righteousness? I grew up in a, in a, a very strong Bible-oriented church. And so we learned many, many verses. But I discovered over time that, that it was very easy to quote a Bible verse, but not really know what it means or apply it. So we could all you know, rally and say, yes, seek first God's kingdom and righteousness. And we, and we all look around each other. We're all proud of ourselves because we all know the verse and we all believe the verse. But now ask us, what does it mean? Say, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> And so when we read this in the text, especially at this level of seminary, you must ask yourself, what does it mean? What does it mean? And as we read Matthew's gospel, we see that the whole gospel answers a question in many different ways. Okay, so that's the second purpose. First purpose, build up the church, clarify. Second purpose, clarify and reinforce community priorities. Third is a contextually framed purpose. To answer the question, what does Christianity have to do with Judaism? But it was not a theoretical question. A, the addressees could have been a community of Jewish Christians in Galilee, where formative Judaism, that's a technical term, is as the predecessor to rabbinic Judaism. Perhaps that's where formative Judaism was developing and flourishing, and thus was a rival to Christianity. Perhaps some of the community felt that they had made a mistake joining the Christian sect. Or they were forced they were being they felt they were being forced to choose between their Jewish faith heritage and their Christian faith. B, if so, Matthew probably wrote his gospel as an apology for the church in its struggle with the synagogue. Both to defend the legitimacy of the church to the Jews and to be sure that the Jewish Christians understand why they should stay with the church. In short, Matthew shows that the church, that the church to be Judaism par excellence. That's his answer. So you can imagine another answer might be the church and the Judaism are have nothing to do with each other. But as I told you earlier, uh, that, that doesn't make sense because the church grew out of Judaism. That wouldn't be a good answer. Somebody else might say the church has replaced Judaism. And some people, that's how some people interpret Paul, for example. But Matthew's gospel seems to be saying the church is Judaism, but the way Judaism is supposed to be, including accepting Christ as the Messiah. So of all the Gospels, it's the most Jewish and the most affirming of its Jewish, the Jewish heritage of Christianity. Um, there's another note in there, but I'm going to skip that and go on to point number two. Now let's start to talk about the Christology of Matthew. Jesus is seen as the fulfillment of the hope of Judaism. Now let's go to the beginning of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And this is the genealogy of Jesus. Now you remember, I trust from your New Testament survey class, that, that only two of the four Gospels have a genealogy of Jesus. Matthew is one. What's the other one? You remember? Luke. Good. We just did Mark and it wasn't there. So you had a 50-50 chance, but Luke is the other one. And they're not exactly the same. But again, today our purpose is not to compare the two genealogies, but to look at Matthew's genealogy to see what he says and just to discuss or to notice what he's emphasizing and to see how his way of structuring the genealogy fits with his Christology. In other words, his view about Jesus and, his, and what he wants to communicate to his community about who Jesus was. All right, so 
First of all, we notice that in, in chapter 1, verse 1, Samuel, would you read uh, the first two verses? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, And then count off the ge genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Okay, and we can stop there. It goes on and on and on. Okay, and uh, but what I want you to see here with this, this uh, introduction is that right away, Matthew wants us to know that Jesus is what? What's it say? Verse 1. The Messiah. He's the Messiah and the son of David. And the son of Abraham. Remember Mark, Jesus Christ is the son of God. So Jesus is the Messiah and son of God. And when we get to Luke, we're going to find out that his genealogy goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. But Matthew also wants us to know he's the Messiah. So they all agree about that. But Matthew wants to emphasize David and Abraham. What does that suggest to you? What is he emphasizing about Jesus? About his heritage? No, not... Well, I mean, it, it, he's very human. But who are David? Who's, who's, who is Abraham? Who is David? Father of faith. The father of faith is right. But that's... Your very, that answer is true, but you're influenced by Paul. First century... Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. Matthew is saying Jesus is Jewish, first and foremost. That's not Luke's first point. It wasn't Mark's first point. I mean, they know he's Jewish. They don't disagree. But that's not their emphasis. It's not John's emphasis, although he talks a lot about his dialogue with the Jews. So whenever you see something that's out of the ordinary... Pay attention to it, because he said that for a reason. He wants us to understand and appreciate the Jewishness of Jesus and Jesus' role in light of Judaism. So then he goes on to talk about Abraham, the father of Isaac and Jacob and Judah. And he goes on to talk about Judah because he wants to talk about the line that leads down. There, there were 12 sons of Jacob, but he picked one, the one that's relevant to Jesus. But let's keep going. Let's see what else he says. Uh, also, the, the, who was David? Now, he was Jewish. But what else was true about David? He was a chosen king. So this is part of a royal line. So Jesus, the Messiah, is Jewish, and he's royal. Right? So he's, he's setting this up. I mean, you can start your gospel any way you want, but every one of his gospel writers was very intentional to set him up and say, this is what I want you to know about Jesus. This is what's important. Now, for many of us in this room, that's the least important thing. <laughs> you don't care that he's Jewish or that he's royal. <laughs> but come on, hang in here, because your job is to understand the theology of Matthew. And Matthew's Theology eventually made its way into the broader church to some extent, not completely. So we're going to be emphasize, We're going to be looking at at Matthew's theology here. All right, uh, son of Abraham, long-awaited Messiah. In verse 17, we'll go ahead here, all the way down to verse 17. So Matthew has his scheme of 14 generations from Abraham to David or 14 from David to the deportation to Babylon 14 generations and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah 14 generations but he this is so Jewish an argumentation to create an argument to try to show something like look look at the order 14 14 14 it comes from Abraham to David the our king Go to the exile where there's hopelessness. Now from the exile to the Messiah, hope. So David was the height of the kingdom. 
The exile was the, the depth of hopelessness. The Messiah now is the ultimate hope for all time. So this is what he's really saying. That's what his message is about. And so Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And I think verse 18 even. Yes, so then in 18, after giving the genealogy, he, he, he goes on and says, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way. And so now he wants to talk about when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. All right. Jewish, son of a king, I mean, descendant of a king, Messiah. But now what's the new element he's adding here in verse 18? The Holy Spirit. And so Frank Matera makes the point in our textbook for this class that ultimately Jesus is the Messiah not because he was the adopted descendant of Abraham or David or anybody else, but because Jesus is the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so again, I want to caution you against sometimes the superficial comparisons people make. You know, Mark is low Christology, it's just he's really mostly a good human being. You know, Matthew talks about Jewish, he's, and he's just about the, the Jewish heritage of Jesus, and so he really was about his descendancy. And John is very spiritual. It's just not, those are overgeneralizations, they aren't true. Because Matthew, even though he sets it up as a Jewish Messiah, really the point is he's the Son of God, which is exactly what we saw in Mark. It's exactly what we're going to see in Luke. It's exactly what we're going to see in John. That's a consistent testimony of the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you and I, as theologians, will be challenged to explain that to anybody. But we don't have to be confused about the biblical witness. It's clear. Everyone believed that in some way that was extraordinary, Jesus was the Son of God. And that's why we listen to him. That's why we follow him. Now, I added one other note that I thought, uh, that I think is valuable here for you to notice in this genealogy. So let's go back to that genealogy just for a minute. And I'm just going to look at the first few verses. We'll start in verse 3 and we'll go to 6. So now, we're, again, we're going down the genealogy leading up to Jesus, or at least leading up to uh, his father, Joseph who adopted Jesus. So Judah is the father of Perez and Zerah by, well, in genealogy, Jewish genealogy, you didn't need to mention the woman. You typically just mention the men. But here he's mentioning the woman. Do you remember the story about Tamar? And so there was a scandal involved about Tamar. So this is a scandalous woman. Of course, Modern biblical interpretation says it's also scandalous about Judah, the man, the man who had sex with her when they weren't married. But so Tamar is mentioned. But then he goes on and says, Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Aram, Aram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Who's Rahab? Remember Rahab? The girl, the woman. Yeah, yes. Who, but who was she? Do you remember who Rahab was? Prostitute. She's a prostitute. So in Jesus' genealogy, we have Tamar, who, was a pro who prostituted herself because of poverty. We don't know why Rahab prostituted herself and made them for the same reason, but they both were prostitutes. We have two prostitutes in a genealogy that doesn't need to mention women at all. But Matthew does. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. Well, who's Ruth? Not a prostitute. Mm -hmm. What's that? Na Naomi's daughter-in-law. She was a foreigner. A foreigner. Again, uh, in Jewish thinking, you don't want foreigners. You don't want prostitutes. You don't want women in your, in your pristine lists of genealogies. Yeah, Matthew here mentions another one that would be an outsider and marginalized person in their society. And 
Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Who was the wife of Uriah? Remember her name? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And under what circumstances did Bathsheba and David have their son Solomon? Well, they were married by the time Solomon came around, but the, the relationship was illicit. According to this genealogy, it's not David's wife. She's the wife of Uriah, the murdered, her murdered husband, because of David. Okay, so I don't know if you talked about this in your New Testament introduction class. This is here for a reason. We have women, outside, outsiders, marginalized people, scandalous people in this genealogy. We don't know why Matthew did it. But I think we could at the very least say that God works in surprising ways. Maybe that is the subtext. And Matthew is working so hard here to say, look, don't run back to Judaism. Don't think you're lesser because you're now Christians instead of Jews. You're, you're equal to Jews. In fact, you come out of Ju Judaism. And in fact, Jesus comes out of this beautiful lineage from Abraham to David to David to the exile to exile to all the way to the Messiah. He's the promised Messiah. He's the Jew of all Jews. Uh, you should worship him. But by the way, notice that God does some very surprising things. He works through outsiders and women. And so, so the subtext is, be ready for a surprise. Don't run back to the conservative old ways. Look for God to be working something new and unexpected. Now, maybe I'm making too much of this. But there has to be some reason that he chose to add these, these women, and, and particularly these particular women, in this context. But I'm trying to now and then just give you an example of what we do in biblical interpretation, and I think even in theology, is noticing what's unusual in the text and pausing long enough to at least speculate about it. All right, let's go on. The Jesus beginning in preparation for ministry. All right, now let's go on and look at Jesus beginnings in preparation for ministry. And notice that when Matthew tells his story, it's very important that he, emphasize, he emphasizes that most of what Jesus did is in fulfillment of Scripture. Now, I've given you a list here. We're not going to take time to read each and every one. The virgin birth is in fulfillment of Scripture. He was born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of Scripture. He was visit, visited by Magi from the East. He lives for a while in Egypt in fulfillment of Scripture. Herod slaughters the toddlers in fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus finally makes his home in Nazareth in fulfillment of Scripture. John the Baptist preaches the nearness of the kingdom and calls for repentance in fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus is baptized. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness and uses Scripture to thwart Satan. Jesus 10, Jesus makes his home in Capernaum in fulfillment of Scripture. So we have here, just, we'll just look at the 1, 123. It says, She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet, by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, of course, you're, you're very familiar with these verses by now. And what I'm doing by showing you just one example from the text, even though we talked about many, is that this is a, a formula for, for Matthew. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord. So this is important to him. When he tells a story, he wants to say, these things didn't happen by accident. There's a connection to the Old Testament. And there's a fulfillment of Scripture. So let me, uh, well, first let me go down to the question here that I have in your guide. Why is Jesus' fulfillment 
of Scripture so important? You may have your own thoughts about it, but let me give you one answer. The prophetic word was sacred in Judaism, ancient Judaism. Matthew clearly believed that Jesus' fulfillment of messianic related prophecies would validate his role as Messiah to the believing Jews. It proved that the Christian faith was not a new and thus false religion, but was a fulfillment of their hopes from their own tradition. So again, as I've been saying over and over again, Matthew's Gospel wants to take the, the Christian Gospel, Jesus Christ, and, and make sure that it's very wedded to the Judaism of his day. And so they would know and understand that. But now might be a good time for me to pause and make a comment about Old Testament prophecy. Because by now you have studied Old Testament theology, I believe, and you should know that passages such as the one that Jesus quotes here in Matthew chapter 1, verse, verse uh, 20, verses 21 through 23. Uh, the quote is 20, verse 23. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. Is taken from Isaiah. Old Testament prophecies were a word of the Lord spoken for, for what day? Were they for the future or for the, or for the day of the prophet? Future. That's what everybody thinks, the future. And that's why from the New Testament, by reading Matthew, we all assume prophecies foretell the future. And they, they do at times. But when we look back carefully at Old Testament prophets and prophecies, the vast majority of those prophecies are really a spoken word for that day. And so this prophecy that, they sh that, that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall name him Emmanuel was really a reference to Isaiah's own wife who was going to bear a son, who was going to then be a sign about how God was going to work in ancient Israel. And so some people, when they first learn that, say, hey, we've been wrong all these years to view it as a prophecy for the future. Well, I think that's partly right, partly wrong. You're wrong if you think that it's only about the future. But you're right if, if uh, I mean, we're wrong to apply it to today, if it's something spoken about in the first day, or the day that it was first spoken. But it seems like many of these prophecies had a dual function. The word was spoken in its own day, but that later writers, later believers would look back and recognize they also pointed to something God was going to do in the future. And so, for us, today, as inheritors of both the Old and the New Testament, we need to affirm both. This was a word of God spoken in Isaiah's day for his day. And yet Matthew and, and Jesus appropriated that word and, and are communicating to us as readers that, that that ancient text had a future fulfillment anticipated as well. Okay, so that's it about prophecy. Now C, Christology. The person, Christology relates to the person and identity of Jesus. So who was Jesus? Well, first of all, he was divine. The supernatural birth in fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14, uh, which is then quoted in 1.18 verses 18 and following that we just looked at up here on the screen, and the miracles and the Father's declaration all suggest that Jesus Christ is divine. As I told you before, it's very difficult for us to fully explain what that means. Because how can, it, how can a human being be divine at the same time? Well, we don't know how that is. But what, what we're doing at this point is simply affirming that's what the New Testament witness says. Consistently. He is divine. He's unique in his relationship with God. Number two, he's the promised deliverer. He fulfilled many Old Testament prophecies as God's supreme agent. Christos, the Greek term for Messiah. 
is a fulfiller of Old Testament prophecies. And Christos is a general term that we find in Matthew. Number three, we find that Jesus is also a kingdom builder. Let's look at a few verses there that illustrate that. Matthew chapter 13, verses 37 through 43, and 16, 18, and 21, 43. All right, so we're using these verses simply to tell you or to point out that the kingdom, Jesus is a kingdom builder or a kingdom grower, whether it's agricultural or a building metaphor uh, or a rock uh, metaphor. Uh, the idea is that the kingdom is something that has to be developed. And that's who Jesus was. He was a developer. And, uh, and that was part of his role. But he was also was, uh, he did this building or this growing as a teacher, as a preacher, as a healer, as a sower. You know, the, the, uh, the very famous story in, uh, Luke cha in Matthew chapter 4, but we also find it in Mark, is the parable of the sower. We find it really in, elsewhere uh, in the New Testament is is this idea that um, Jesus is sowing seeds, planting seeds, and, and making them grow, and preaching the good news, and um, and uh, doing all sorts of things to bring something about that did not exist uh, prior, without him. Uh, and so we see some of these these verses here. Uh, Jesus began to proclaim. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He went out throughout Galilee teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. Jesus is doing the work of the kingdom. It's happening. He's not just proclaiming something that's going to happen later on. And it's Again, this is so relevant to us as we think about what is the gospel we're preaching in our churches? What are we preaching about the kingdom of God? And in some of our churches that we've become so accustomed to talking about the promises of God are just for the future. Whereas the gospel witnesses that the kingdom has already come or it's near, but the signs of the kingdom are already happening and beginning with Jesus and his work changing things, helping people, and, and bringing things to pass in, in very dynamic ways. At the same time as he, that he is building, uh, he's also bringing division in, in a triumphal effort, effort to bring justice. Let's look at just a few passages for that. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Why don't we look at that one? Thomas, would you read these verses for us? And then, thank you. And then there's chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. From Matthew's point of view, the Messiah was someone who, who was very concerned about practical concerns, about issues of justice. Often when we, when we generalize about uh, social justice and concern about social justice, uh, which gospel is usually emphasized? Luke is often emphasized. And then those who are interested in social justice really like to go to Luke for multiple reasons, good reasons. But I want to, to, to tell you that that's not unique to Luke. Matthew is very clear that, that Jesus was concerned about the suffering people, this healing and caring for their needs. And the prophecies and, and that, and, that Matthew chooses to, to quote include this mission of Jesus to bring justice. And, and you don't talk about justice except where there's injustice. So those who, are, who have been oppressed, those who are suffering due to injustice are given hope because of the Messiah. Again, we, you know we've talked about, we talk often about the Myanmar context in terms of what is the gospel being preached in the, in the different contexts. 
And in some of our churches, there's such a focus on the future life and the spiritual blessings, forgiveness of sins and eternal life, life after death, that sometimes there is, has been omitted or neglected that part of the gospel message is, the, is the, the call to care for the practical needs, the social needs, the economic needs, um, the physical needs of the people. And that, and that part of the gospel is a call to, to seek justice and to hope for justice, and to pray for justice, so that our communities can be just places uh, as, as an expression of the kingdom of God. Uh, but at the same time, in order to do this, to speak out, to, to work for justice, sometimes requires speaking out against injustice. And perhaps that's what was meant earlier in those verses where Matthew says, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And so there's going to be division, even within families. Uh, we don't know exactly what that meant in his original context. But verses like this, or put all these verses together, and we realize that we have in Matthew this interest in, in portraying a gospel message that really affects us socially. Sometimes positively, but sometimes negatively. And just as we saw earlier when we talked about Mark, there Jesus said, my mother and brothers or sisters are those who do the will of God. He was willing, to, he insisted on putting the will of God first. So Matthew would put the will of God ahead of our own comfort and peacefulness. Christ came to bring peace in the world on one level, but on the other hand, at times he, his message is, is not peaceful. Why not? Because it disrupts the current order. It disrupts systems of oppression. It disrupts injustice. And it calls us to think about how should things be. And Jesus' message leads us to a place where we're willing to speak the truth and to work for the truth. Point number four, Christology. Jesus is also the judge and the ruler of the coming kingdom. He was raised from the dead and exalted to authority over the universe. So we have many such verses, uh, but I think that uh, we'll just simply leave it at that and simply say that Jesus is the king in the future. Point number five, he's also a redeemer. He's not merely a teacher of a div the divine will. And so, again, we've, sometimes we talk about the comparison of or con contrast of Christianity to Buddhism. Jesus is not like Buddha in the sense he was just a great teacher and a great example. He is that, for sure. But he's also a redeemer in Matthew. And uh, so we'll look at a few verses here because that's such an important concept. Well known in traditional churches, of course. Um, but something we want to highlight here as we're trying to give a full picture of who Jesus is according to Matthew. Here in Matthew 1, 21, the quote, uh, or the word of the, of the angel to Mary says uh, she will bear a son. I guess this is to Joseph, excuse me, saying she will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So in verse 18, chapter 18, 18, says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So again, there's this spiritual connection between the, what the followers of Jesus do and the spiritual reality in heaven. And then chapter 26, verses 20, 28, verse 28 says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Another reason I'm emphasizing this is because for many of you, you would say, you know this very well, is that I want you to see that you do not have to choose between a social gospel-oriented Jesus, a liberator Jesus, and a spiritually-oriented Jesus. 
Because the Gospels really witness to a, a multifaceted Jesus who, who is our spiritual Savior. Without forgiveness and redemption, there is no long-term hope. But his interest is very much in what's happening in this earth and in our human relationships uh, and, and, and the experience we have with one another and, and in society. Point number six, Jesus is also superior to the Pharisees. His teaching represents the true interpretation of the law. This is an extremely important concept for Matthew because as we've said over and over again, Jesus is Jewish, Jesus is the great Jewish man. Christianity is, is an outgrowth of Judaism. Christianity really is Judaism, properly understood. So, how are we to understand who Jesus is vis-a-vis -vis or, or face to face to the, the Pharisees and other religious leaders? Well, he is the one that gives us the true interpretation of the law. So he's not against the law. He's not against Judaism. But he offers a true interpretation. So let's look at just one passage here in chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Okay, so, so you get the idea. I, I trust Jesus is in dialogue with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are right to, to challenge the disciples. They're breaking the law. So what is, what is Matthew telling us by sharing the story? What would you say? What, what is the point of sharing the story with us? Humans are more important than law. Humans are more important than law. And a right interpretation of the law means that you know when to apply it and when you can, when something supersedes the law. And that is human need. And that God is a God not of law making and law keeping. The law is to help us, but ultimately God is a God of compassion who desires mercy, not just, when it says not sacrifice, he's not talking about sacrificially serving Christ, as we talked about with Mark. He's talking about animal sacrifices in fulfillment of the law. He's saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He said, if you would understand rightly what the situation was, you would have judged differently. Well, this is extremely relevant for, our, for us today. In churches where there tends to be legalism and self-righteousness and, and rigidity, around legal issues, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we really honoring the spirit of the law? The law gives guidelines about what's right and what's wrong. We never do away with that. But some circumstances require compassion and exceptions. That could lead to a very big discussion that we don't have time for right now. Um, but I just want to mention it so that you keep it in mind as you think about modern ethics and some of the modern social issues. Then in responding to some of the concerns of people, people who are struggling, people who feel marginalized, people who feel abused or, or uh, taken advantage of, exploited, and sometimes they suffer under our rigid structure, a hierarchical structure, we have to ask ourselves, are we responding compassionately, mercifully, to people who are suffering, people in need? That's what Jesus' ethic is. And from, from a Christological point of view, what Matthew's also saying is what I said earlier, is that we ought to look at Jesus as the true interpreter of the law. That's one of his great contributions, it was not just that he told us what Judaism was about and affirmed it, but that he helped us understand, or helped them understand, where Judaism had become too legalistic. It was now hurting people rather than helping people. And there are many such examples in the Gospel of Matthew, where the Pharisees are upholding the letter of the law, or upholding the letter of tradition, but they are not really responding to the needs of the people. Well, quickly, we see here Matthew's Christology also reveals that he's the son of David, which we already mentioned earlier, but he says it many times. 
He really wants to say that Jesus is not only Jewish, but he's royal. So he is a king and a future king in the line of David, which was an eternal covenant. And then lastly, he's a revealer of God. And we'll look at that one verse, chapter 11, verse 27. Here is one of Jesus' prayers. And why don't we go ahead and read verses 25 through 27. To me, this is a very curious verse in Matthew. Very interesting and important. Because as we've been saying over and over again, Matthew is, is showing how Jesus is an outgrowth of Judaism and the Jewish, his Jewish line from Abraham. And, and yet here, he, his language is quite a bit like the Gospel of John. It's one of the few places in all of Matthew where he sounds a little bit like John because he's saying, only the Son knows the Father and only those to whom the Son reveals the Father will know the Father. And so as a revealer of God, we recognize that Jesus, again, was more than a teacher, more than a preacher, more than a miracle worker, even more than a redeemer. But the part of his spiritual work is to show certain people, apparently not everyone, the ones the Son chooses to reveal him to, to help us see where the Father is. Okay, why is that so important? Because what it says is that from the early Christian tradition, and Matthew is one example, and it's elsewhere in, in the New Testament, that the ability to believe in Christ and to really know God the Father is something that has to be, has to come from Jesus Christ or the Spirit of Christ. It's the work of Christ. And this is one of the reasons in Christian theology has often been very Christocentric. Now today, and you've heard me say that I much prefer a Trinitarian-centric view because we need to emphasize the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we just do one of the three, something or someone's going to be left out. The Christian tradition has said uh, from the beginning that really knowing the Father is something that has to be revealed to us. It can't be argued. It's not something that we, we rationalize and we logically see, oh yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. It doesn't come from human intellect. The wisest philosophers, the wisest teachers and thinkers cannot think their way to God the Father or cannot think their way to seeing who Jesus Christ is. And so in the end, those of us who are Christians and have a relationship with Christ, a relationship with God the Father through Christ, do so by faith, but also recognize and admit as part of our confession that this is something that was a gift to us. We didn't earn it. We weren't clever enough or smart enough to figure it out. It was something that the Spirit of Christ convinced us of and that we were able to see something that we couldn't see otherwise. That's part of the work of Christ. Okay, that brings us to the end of this first session of, of uh, Matthew. And when we come back from break, we will talk about discipleship. We now turn to Roman numeral number three on your guide, which is the subject of discipleship. And as you probably have figured out by now that for each one of our Gospels, we spend time focusing on what does the Gospel say about the main subject, Jesus Christ, and then secondly, what does this Gospel have to say about us, those of us who would follow? Now, remember again, as academicians, as scholars and students, our first question should be, what does this book say, what did this book say to the early disciples? Because this book was written for a particular community in a particular time and place. We don't necessarily know which community. We, we try to, to know, but, but it's hard because we're lacking certain information. But our first line of, an, of analysis should be, what is Matthew saying to whatever disciples he's speaking to in his own day? And at the same time, or, or afterwards, it's appropriate for us to be asking ourselves, and what does this message say to us today? 
One of the things we, we mentioned before in previous lectures is that we should not combine all four Gospels together and just say there's one picture of Jesus and one message about discipleship. Life is more complicated than that and the early Christianity was more complicated than that and interpreting the Bible is more complicated than that. And, and so our best approach, the one we're taking in this class, is to look at each writer individually. And of course there will be much overlap in terms of their image of Jesus and in their message about discipleship. But we also want to notice where they're different. And so that we can appreciate the distinctives of each gospel writer and also appreciate uh, what is the message that they want to emphasize because at some point in our life, we may need to hear what Mark wants to emphasize, but at another point, perhaps it's what Matthew wants to emphasize, or later, at another time, Luke or John. So all the messages are important, even though they are emphasized or applied at different times in different places. So today, Matthew. So what is required to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew? Well, there are several things, several things we're going to cover, seven points here in your guide. The first is implicit faith in God and Jesus are required. Let me remind you again what implicit means versus explicit. Explicit it means when the author specifically says, you must have faith in God or you must have faith in Jesus. But sometimes it's implied. He doesn't say it directly, he says it indirectly. And that's what we call implicit. So when we say implicit faith in God, it means he may not tell you directly, but he wants you to get that message. And the message comes from the stories that we read. As we said again when we talked about Mark, is that one of the, the, the part of the power of narrative uh, writing and narrative theology is that we can learn so much just from the story. We're supposed to draw lessons from the story, which is very different than Paul's writing, who tells us directly. So, what do we learn from some of the stories about faith in Matthew? Well, I put on the screen here several verses that, uh, that, talk, that give us an idea of how Jesus communicated to the disciples. So, uh, uh, Shaya, would you read uh, the first three verses for us? Okay, thank you. So, we're not really discussing the context there. I think you probably recognize this. The first time was when, when he was, Jesus was out and the disciples on the, on the water and the, and the storm came and they were afraid and so he rebukes them. Uh, another time uh, in chapter 14 is when Peter walks on the water and it starts to sink. And then the last time, the, uh, the last <clears throat> example in chapter 16, uh, he was t talking uh, when uh, the disciples were discussing among themselves about not having bread. Uh, but what do you notice in every one of these examples? What does Jesus say to his disciples? Faith. Yeah, you of little faith. So. From a narrative point of view, what we can see or observe is that if Jesus says this to his disciples, faith must be important. And so he rebukes them for having little faith. And what that means is those of us who are the readers should take from this that faith is important and we should look at our own faith. Do we have little faith or do we have a lot of faith? That's how a narrative works. And we see that example. And and so from a theological point of view, which is our emphasis in this class, we see that discipleship must include faith. It's not just about action, it's about faith, and faith in Jesus in particular, and about what, what Jesus can do. But that's not the only testimony in Matthew. Let's look at these other uh, verses as well. Why don't you read uh, the next three, La Roche? And so we can see from these examples that even though Jesus did say to them on several occasions, Oh, you of little faith. Also, they did hear. They did believe. And the fact that Peter got out of the, the boat at all 
is a sign that he did reach out and he did step out in faith. Now he got a little frightened, um, but he did step out in faith. And then the end result, we see in 1432, is that after Jesus acted and showed his power to them, then they confessed, truly you are the Son of God. So that's a statement of faith based on their experience with him. So again, from a narrative point of view, what we should see is that in real life, disciples struggle between faith and lack of faith. And sometimes they believe and sometimes they don't believe. And that, but through their interaction with Jesus and through the experience with Jesus, it leads to a confession of faith. What we might imagine is that in Matthew's community, there were those who had faith, but then had little faith. And they struggled. And maybe some of them stepped out, not on the water, but they stepped out in faith. But then because of persecution or because of other troubles, they, they started sinking. Not literally, but metaphorically. And so what these stories are telling us is that even though it gets frightening and we become worried about what's going to happen, if we continue on in faith, we will experience Jesus helping us to walk on water again. All right, so faith is very, very important for discipleship. But let's go on. What else is important? Inner good, goodness as well as legal observances. Let's look at a couple passages here. Uh, there are many. In chapter 5, for example. Uh, but let's just look at the one in, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Um, let's read this. Samuel, why don't you read a few verses and then we'll, we'll have other people read. Okay. So, so what, do you, what do you take from these verses? Jesus is giving a lot of examples here about practicing your righteousness, giving to the needy, uh, praying. But there's a certain way he wants you to do those things. Here's the point. Is if we, if we do it to impress other people, it's not true righteousness. So maybe we're giving money, we're praying out loud, or we're trying to make a show of our faith. He says, if you do that, you're just doing that for, to, to get the favor of other people. Yes. He says, that's not the righteousness I have in mind. Or, for the example, the pagans, they would pray many, many words trying to convince God. He said, no, God already knows. And so, what these few examples, and there are other examples, and I, I put the, the references in your guide. What they're saying is, the righteousness that, that, that Jesus desires, that God desires, that Jesus taught about, has got to be something that's inside. Something that's inside, genuine, real. And it's about a relationship with God that is genuine. And it's not about impressing other people. We really know God. We love God. We want to serve God. And it comes out of that place. And you've heard me say in other context here at MIT and uh, in other classes that the spirituality that we find in the New Testament really is about a personal relationship with God and with Christ. It's not about tradition alone or religion alone. It's not about doing good works alone. There's a place for all those things. But the most important thing is actually knowing God and loving God and serving God from our hearts. That's the kind of faith that Jesus Christ taught us about and that he showed us by his own life. So that's certainly true in Matthew. And Matthew is a very strong witness to the quality of our righteousness. All right, point number three. We're answering the question, what is required of a disciple? The third point is imitation of his loving service. Faith in action is required. So now let's look at one of the most famous passages in Matthew. I say it's famous because it seems like it often comes up in conversation or is preached about. And I think you'll recognize it right away when I put it up from Matthew 25. And here we see, uh, so maybe, uh, Shayad, do you want to read? Yes. And so this is, a, this is a great example 
of, of how in Matthew righteousness is not about just being forgiven for our sins. Righteousness is actually doing the right thing. And the right thing is caring for our brothers and sisters in need. I don't think it could be any clearer <laughs> that this is what Jesus Christ expects from us. That, that discipleship means doing the right thing, caring for other people in need. And in fact, Jesus says, inasmuch as you do that for the, the least of these, you're doing it for me. And that's why many of you have certainly heard that when we're reaching out to a needy person, we should be thinking that we're actually reaching out to Jesus. Because Jesus says, that, that's me, when you're caring, you're caring for those people. Now, from a theological point of view, it, it raises a question about Matthew's soteriology. And so, if you just read these verses and didn't read any other verses, what is the basis of salvation? according to, to these verses, according to this one parable, if you will. Salvation, you'd say salvation is based on action. An action. And, and, and as we'll talk about in the future, when we, when we study James, it's, a, it's on works. But you remember when we talked about Paul, we said salvation is by grace through faith. And so, so we find here this is perhaps one of the clearest examples of tension in the New Testament. Matthew and James, more than any other of the New Testament writers, clearly say that faith without action is, is dead. It's meaningless. And, and this story that Matthew uh, recounts from, with the, from the lips of Jesus is that there is no salvation without action. So in this course, I want you to struggle with that. Because I want you to think about what, what does this really mean? Because in the history of the church over the last 2,000 years, we've had different churches interpret this tension differently. As you might imagine, those who look just at Paul say, hey, it's very clear, we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest anyone should boast. You remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. All right. Remember, you're supposed to memorize those two verses for the midterm exam. <laughs> okay. okay, so it's so important. And the Protestant revolu revolution, excuse me, the Protestant Reformation uh, really was about f getting back to Paul's message because they felt like the, their Catholic Church had emphasized works too much. And they were selling indulgences and, and really giving the people the wrong idea that salvation really is about um, spending money and, and, and then maybe doing good works and, and a whole set of, of teachings that, that they felt was not true to the New Testament. But nevertheless, here we are looking at Matthew. And Matthew is really clear. The righteousness has to be action. Well, I'm not going to answer that for you right now. But I want, I want you to feel that tension. And that as we're doing New Testament theology, in the spirit that, that we've talked about many times, and we'll come back to this at the very end of the course, when we, when we try to put all these, these different teachings together, is for you to think about how, how are you going to honor all of the writers of the New Testament? All of their teachings. Because we have Paul who's teaching didactically, straightforward, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Boom, boom, boom. And Jesus, m more or less as a, as a story, uh, kind of a parable, Im imagines that th at the end of time there's, they're separating the sheep and the goats. But he comes here at the end says, this is the result. At the very least, we, sh we should acknowledge that in Jesus' day, if Matthew is a fair representation of that, that the Jewish people of his day believed that righteousness required doing good deeds. And that Jesus taught in that Jewish milieu that doing, doing right, living right, caring for the poor is required. It's not optional. Okay, so that's point number three. 
Uh, and again, there's, a, there's another point in here, but I'll let you um, read about that on your own. Uh, I can just mention it quickly. I said, the call for mercy is a repeated theme and provides a core value for the right interpretation of the law for Jesus. It's based on Hosea 6.6. 6. Thus, Luke is not, on, is not the only one who is so concerned. And maybe it would be good just for a moment here, just for me to put this on the screen. Hosea 6.6 6 is where, Jesus, is where the, the prophet says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. We talked about that earlier. And, and when we explained that from Jesus' point of view, based on the Old Testament prophets, God was not just concerned with following the laws and following the rituals. He really was concerned about a heart of mercy, a heart of compassion, a heart of loving kindness, translation for the chesed in, in the Hebrew, and that shows itself in deeds of mercy. And so when Jesus tells this parable about the goats and the sheep, uh, it's really, it's not a new teaching, but rather it's, it's a right interpretation of the law based on the teaching of the prophets. Okay. Now, point number four. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Fidelity in the evangelistic message. So let's just look at, at just two verses for that. This comes at the very end of, of the book. The very, very end, the last two verses. And so this, this is often called what? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. And this has been the, the cornerstone, if you will, for Christian missions for 2,000 years. Christian mission has always been about making disciples of others, sharing the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and so, again, in our modern context, we're at MIT, where we try to emphasize that the Christian faith needs to be concerned about both a spiritual life, a relationship with God, a forgiveness of sins, the good news that comes in Christ, and at the same time, an honoring of the, the command of Jesus to go out and to be caring for those who are struggling and poor. As you, as, you hear, as you have heard me say, and will hear me say over and over again, we do not need to choose between gospel ministry and social ministry. Honestly, just looking at the Gospel of Matthew alone, we should see that both are important. And I would hope that, that as you're forming your own theology and preparing for a lifetime of, of Christian ministry, that you won't emphasize just one to the neglect of the other. Both are important. Point number five, the church. Uh, according to Frank Matera, our, our, our textbook for this class, he says, the church is the true and truly righteous people of God, entrusted with the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Only Matthew among the church, the gospel writers, uses the term church which is ecclesia in Greek. The, so that term church, ecclesia, refers to Jesus' followers, but, but Matthew is the only one that, that uses that term. Ecclesia is a Greek term stemming from the Septuagint's translation of the Hebrew kahal, which means assembly or congregation. And we can compare the Greek term for the Jewish assembly, which is synagogue. So you're familiar with all of these terms. Now, only Matthew gives instructions of Jesus clearly intended for the post-resurrection church. So let's go to Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Our goal at this moment is not to discuss this particular teaching, but just to notice that in verse 17, Jesus says, that if the offender doesn't listen to your rebuke or that of two or three people, take it to the church. Well, in Jesus' day, there was no church yet. And so this is an example of, of where we find the gospel writers 
really are writing from the perspective of their own day. This is very difficult for us to completely sort out, but, but once in a while it's really clear that that's the case. And so Matthew must have in mind his own day because a church exists. So what was Jesus' original words? If he didn't use the word church, what did he say? Well, I think you know the answer. We don't know. We can't go back to that. But as I said to you before, I'm hoping that through your, your education here at MIT, you're learning that our goal really is not to take the teaching of the New Testament, every word literally. So these words are in the mouth of Jesus. But we also suspect that some of the language is from 50 years later. And so what are our options? We can either say, as some conservative, very conservative people would say, is, well, Jesus must have said them because they're in the Bible. And they just, they just refuse to admit that the word church would not have been in Jesus' mouth. Uh, of course, he didn't speak Greek anyway, so it's already a translation. So there's a lot we don't know. Or others would say, oh, this was clearly written by Matthew, and this is Matthew's idea. Maybe it's not Jesus' idea at all. And that's the other extreme. But the middle way uh, that, that uh, often we'll choose, uh, if it seems reasonable, is to say that Matthew sincerely believed that what he wrote down fairly represents what Jesus did teach, even if his language is in his own day. And again, and again you and I can't not go back to answer that question definitively. Um, so in the end, what do we do? We have Matthew's Gospel, we have the message as he represents it, and we hold that up, we detail what that is, we hold that up against the messages we find in other books. And if, if there's no reason to object to the message, and the message seems to be edifying and helpful to the church, historically, what most interpreters have done over the last 2,000 years is just to receive it and accept it as the Word of God for today. So, and I realize that, that in our lectures here on the Synoptic Gospels that a number of times I'm making comments that really relate to biblical exegesis, uh, even though we're focusing on New Testament theology. Um, but the reason I'm doing that is I don't want you to get tripped up by these exegetical issues so that you can't receive the theology that's coming. Uh, that, that's my motivation. All right, point number six. The question arises as to how should we interpret the Sermon on the Mount? So Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, uh, we, we have a lot of teaching that's you know, extremely important. And we see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And so that's why this is traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount, on the mountain. He goes up the mountain, sits down, that's in, the, in keeping with the, the, the Jewish rabbi culture, they taught sitting down. I'm sitting down today. Uh, many times a, a Buddhist monk may sit down and teach. Uh, and, and so the, this was, a, this was a, a revered place in many traditions. Um, but then the following chapters are, are full of very practical instructions. The Beatitudes come first, but in blessings come first. And then in chapter 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. So it explains to them who they are. And 17, do not think I've come to abolish the law and prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but fulfill them. So he talks about that. And then in 21, you've heard it said that to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anybody who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Wow. I mean, this is intense. I mean, how many of you now qualify for hell based on the things you've said or thought about other people? Well, I'm going to guess it's most of us, right? Uh, if we're honest. But the Sermon on the Mount is full of that kind of teaching. And so what we find in Matthew is that Jesus not only upholds the law, 
But he goes further and says, you just think it, or you say something kind of like it, and you deserve hell. So this is very intense. And so you see, I'm underscoring this for you. I'm making sure you see it in the text. Because we spent three or four weeks on Paul, and some of you may have been lulled into complacency and say, yes, we're saved by grace through faith. Hallelujah, right? And so we feel at peace. Well, of course, I want you to feel peace. Because Paul wants you to feel peace. But I don't want you to misunderstand that not only Paul, but especially Matthew and other writers fully expect that we're going to try to live by God's righteous requirements, even though our salvation is not based on that. Now Jesus, according to Matthew, does not talk like Paul. <laughs> and so he just talks like the Jewish, a Jewish rabbi would talk, and that is, you must take this seriously and you're going to be judged by this. And so those of us who are doing New Testament interpretation, New Testament theology, who want to embrace all 27 books, must include the teachings of Matthew as well as the teaching of Paul. And those who, who, va who value the teaching of Matthew, I would say, must also incorporate the teaching of Paul. But right now we're in Matthew. And you can see the, the, extre the extremes to which he goes. So how should we interpret such extreme teaching? Well, as I put in your guide, there are several key options. One is, it's a guideline for Jews. In other words, since these, are, these purport to be Jesus' words to Jewish people under the law, that he's telling them that this really is how the law ought to be interpreted. And so, so for example, then someone who's uh, a Gentile Christian might say, well, I'm going to look at Paul, Paul's interpretation, and then I'm going to read this, of course, but I recognize that it's not for me, it's for the Jewish people in Jesus' day. So some people will say that's an interpretation. That's how they reconcile having these two very different teachings in the New Testament. Another option would be that it is an un unattainable ideal to show that we must depend on God. All right? And uh, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example. And perhaps, uh, perhaps I'd be here, but this, this may not be a good example, so forgive me, but it's a terrible example. Uh, but this is, I think about, uh, if, you, if you want to uh, play in the, the Olympics, uh, perhaps you want to, uh, to run the mile, a speed, run the mile in the Olympics. And you come to me and you say, I can run the mile pretty fast. I can do it in five minutes. And what shall I say to you? I should say, I could say, well, that's faster than I can run it, <laughs> but it's not fast enough. Because the standard in the Olympics is you have to beat four minute mile in order to compete. And, by, and for me, telling you what that ideal is, that helps you understand that even though you're fast, you're not fast enough. So I'm not being cruel to you. I'm not being unkind. I'm, I'm helping you see the truth. Because if I don't tell you that, you might go out and you practice and you practice and you try to get, get, get nominated to be in the Olympics for your country. And, uh, but you don't qualify. Perhaps that's what Jesus is doing, some people say. For the people who want to walk around and say, you know, I'm a righteous person, I follow the law. I, and so many people are wicked people, but I'm a very righteous person. I'm, I'm up here. And Jesus is saying, all right, maybe you are pretty righteous, but God's standard's up here. You can't, you can't get there. Now, he doesn't say that. Paul did that, remember? Romans chapter 3, he, he made it clear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So he, he made the point clearly. But maybe Jesus isn't doing that. He's just simply holding up the ideal, preparing people for the message that came later. Right? So that's another possibility. So we've got two possibilities. One, this message is for the Jews in Jesus' day, not for us. Two, it's a message for all people to understand what righteousness really is. 
and that none of us get to that. That's another way to reconcile those two messages. A third possibility is that it's a guideline for Christians. In other words, uh, it's Jesus' teaching helps us understand what it means to be righteous. Martin Luther said that's the third use of the law. Now this isn't law so much as Jesus' interpretation of the law, but it's, a, it's really the same thing. And it could, perhaps it could be a guideline for us. So again, we're not going to use this, if, if, if option three is correct, we're probably not going to use this and say, watch out, or you're going to go to hell if you curse your mother or father or your friend. But you need to know that God calls you to bless and not curse. So if you're cursing, stop. Right? If you're unkind, you're hateful, stop. It's not what God wants for you. And I'm at, from a pastoral point of view, I've been ordained now for over 35 years, working in ministry and as a teacher and as a minister. Uh, I know that, that those kinds of messages are very important. They're practical. We should not just preach about the grace of God. We must also preach about the righteous requirements of God. Okay, so, so, this is, so this is important for you to, as you struggle with, how should you interpret the Sermon on the Mount? All right, lastly, again, we're answering the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus according to Matthew? And according to Frank Matera, basically, we should view this as a basic definition of, of what it means to be a disciple. Those who believed in Jesus as Savior received his forgiveness, they lived a righteous life, and they were appointed heirs to the kingdom of heaven, if they were and did what Jesus asked. We'll go here to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, and where Jesus says, and we read this in the earlier session, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, that's the judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. I think there are a lot of verses in Matthew that are a little scary, a little frightening. But again, from a a pastoral point of view and just a, a personal perspective uh, of it from my experience. Sometimes I need to be frightened. I need to be reminded that my actions matter and that, and that there is a consequence for my behavior. We read, in, we read in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm emphasizing it repeatedly, but I'm trying to provide a counterbalance to a misunderstanding of Paul. The teaching of the grace, on the grace and love of God is so important for our peace of mind and our, and our love relationship with God. But yet, a healthy fear of the Lord is still important. That helps us stay righteous and to do the right thing. Uh, so that's Matthew's point of view. Frank Matera says, whereas Paul uses righteousness, quote unquote, in a theological sense to depict the gift of God to the justified, Matthew employs it in an ethical sense to describe the conduct of those who belong to the kingdom. This is something you can just think about, and if you do have questions, bring this up later in our question and answer period. Right, let's go ahead with our, our guide, and we're going to go more quickly through the remaining material because the, the most important thing we wanted to emphasize in this session was discipleship. Uh, but, but we do want to talk about the place of the Old Testament law in Christian living. And I've already made some comments on that, but I have a whole section of it here on it here in your guide. The first main point is that Matthew affirms the law and denounces the leading practitioners of the law, namely the Pharisees and the religious leaders. But as we said before, the, the apparent context for Matthew 
is to portray Christianity in light of Judaism. And what he wants everyone to understand in his community is that Christians are law-abiding. They're law-abiding. Andy Overman, who's a professor, or was a professor at McAllister University, uh, or actually McAllister College in, uh, in St. Paul, or, or Minneapolis-St. Paul area uh, where, where I live, says that Jesus is saying Christians most certain must Excuse, excuse me, Christians most certainly observe the law. Don't think that they don't. The issue is the right interpretation of the law. Jesus had it. Everything governed by the core value of compassion and love, Hosea 6.6. 6. The Pharisees did not. So again, what we're trying to help you understand here, and as you learn how to properly interpret Matthew, is that I want you to, to say to, your, to yourself and to your congregation, the law is, was still important to early Christians. But it wasn't the law as the Jewish people of Jesus' day understood it. It was the law as Jesus understood it and Jesus explained it. And this is so important uh, for a proper understanding of, of the law and, and how to to teach on, to provide ethical teaching based on the New Testament. So, a few examples. Breaking the, the Sabbath to eat grain. We read this earlier uh, in the first session. Um, we could call that reasonable non-compliance. The Old Testament precedent demonstrates that God is more concerned about responding to need than legalistic observance of the law when one is forced to choose between the two. And again, we talked about that earlier today. Secondly, first things first. Clean and unclean. In Matthew 15, 1-20, we see Jesus teaching on clean and unclean. And so, the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do, you, do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. So you can, now today, why do you wash your hands before you eat? For hygiene, right? Because you don't want to get sick. But for them, it was, had a religious meaning. But it really was about their tradition. And this is a great example of, for, the, for the religious leaders of Jesus' day, tradition was very, very important. And we certainly know that in our modern culture, tradition is also very important to many of our religious leaders. So this is nothing new, nothing old. I mean, it's, it's, or I should say it's both, new and old, the respect for tradition. But you can go too far with respecting tradition. Tradition has a place to provide structure and continuity in religion. But we must all, always remember what is the most important thing or what are the most important things. And to Jesus it was about responding to human need. Mercy, compassion, kindness, goodness, love. And if we have that at the core of who we are, then we're going to be able to make right judgments. And we're not going to fall back on tradition or the law as an excuse to not do the right thing for somebody else. That's what Jesus was teaching over and over again. And that leads to point number C here, is that love is the first priority. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. And so, this should be very, very clear, and, and this is very familiar to you, of course, but I want you to just see it in the text, that Jesus really did say, according to Matthew and, and other Gospel writers, that loving God is first, Loving others a second. They're not the same thing. They're related, um, but they are separate too. And in terms theologically, that we recognize that for Matthew, as well as other gospel writers, love is not just action, it's, it's a relationship. It involves heart, soul, mind, and actions. And so we should not combine these two. In the pietistic movement, 
that's a uh, strain of Christianity, popular at the end of the 19th century and still quite popular with evangelicals today, emphasizes love of God. And that's my tradition. And so I often will emphasize that and I emphasize teaching on spirituality. Loving God and being in a personal relationship with God, it, to me it seems clearly the, the center, should be at the center. But that's not to the exclusion of the second commandment. Because the love of God that we receive should provide this deep well or resource or reservoir of love from which we can draw to show love to others. I believe that we cannot show love to others consistently unless we've experienced the love of God for ourselves. And so this is not just my personal belief. I believe it also comes from, from this kind of interpretation from these verses. So, so much of Matthew is about righteousness and about law-abiding. If you only read Matthew, I think you might feel that we just must go out and do the right thing and, and, and do deeds and change the world for the better. And, and, and I agree with all that. But do not miss the priority of loving God. And then if you take that teaching combined with the teaching on spirituality that we find in the Apostle Paul and certainly the Gospel of John that we'll talk about in a couple weeks, you find that the real secret or key to being able to do the will of God is to know God and to love God. Then you can serve God. Now, Frank Matera points out that only Matthew of the Gospel writers adds this additional sentence uh, in Jesus' mouth. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And so interpreters often notice that and then they'll, they say, you see, Matthew is very concerned to tie Jesus back to the law and prophets. So don't think, Matthew is saying, that Jesus is starting a new religion or that Jesus' teaching supersedes everything that came before. Matthew says, no, no, no. The law is still important, the, and the prophets are still important. But Jesus gives us the right interpretation of the law, and what Jesus taught about love really comes out of the law and the prophets. So he's always trying to link them together. But he never goes all the way back to a Judaism without Jesus. But he'll never go to a, a Jesus without Judaism. So they both have to be together in Matthew's theology. Frank Matera says that love is the hermeneutical key for, for the law. And we haven't talked much about that word hermeneutics, but hermeneutics simply mean a method of interpretation. And so we talk about a hermeneutical key, we're talking about you know, a door that has a lock on it, or a little lock that has a lock underneath like the one over, over there, that you have to put a key in, you turn, and then the lock opens, right? That's how a lock works. And he says, if you understand love, and you put that key into the law and turn it, then you're going to understand what the law is about. But if you look at the law just as a series of commandments that you don't understand about love, you're not going to understand properly. So, so Frank Matera says, that's really what Matthew is saying. In spite of all this harsh teachings, and scary teachings sometimes, and what might even seem like legalistic and overly legalist, beyond legalism, he's really at his heart saying love is the, is the key. But it's not a soft love, a mushy love, where we just sit, sit around, hold hands, uh, or just to drink tea together. Uh, it's a love in action, a love in action. And so the law remains val valid for disciples. This is point D in your guide. Here, Matthew unambiguously commands obedience to the law. To what is essential is that the, the fulfillment of the law is determined by one's interpretation of the law. And third, there are no such parallels in the other Gospels, but compare James. So Matthew is at an extreme. I told you that, but I want to remind you that again. That when, we're, when we look at all 27 books, we're going to put Matthew and probably James at, at one extreme in terms of their connection to Judaism and their emphasis on working in deeds. But the, but the New Testament theology that you're, you're developing in this course uh, is going to include more than Matthew and James. 
But today we're just placing Matthew in particular where he belongs. And so just quickly here, point number two, under the place of the Old Testament law in Christian living. Christianity is not a renewal of the old or a Jews only club. The kingdom of heaven is a new and powerful movement. Here in Matthew 11, 12, verse 12, we see from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. This is, this is a notoriously difficult verse to interpret. What violence is he talking about? Well, I don't know the answer for sure. But what I can say is that this is an example of saying something new is happening. And, and, and there's a lot of energy involved. In the, and with Jesus coming, the disciples who followed Jesus, that something new is breaking in on, on the world. Uh, this is not an attempt to establish a Christian Phariseeism. The gospel is for the whole world. And perhaps Matthew's point is, it is possible to include Gentiles in the community without abandoning the law as God intended it. And that's Femi Perkins' uh, point. The Great Commission, what are its distinctive characteristics? Uh, we talked about this already, but let me again put the, those verses on the, the screen here for us. Notice that it includes going. <laughs> Go where? Uh, we're going into outside of our own nation. We're going to all the nations, ultimately. Make disciples of all nations, he says. So, so for those of you who are wondering, well, in our minds, or should we just live and let live? You know, you tell somebody, you have your religion, we have ours. Let's just be friends. Let's just have peace among us. Well, I'm all for peace. But the biblical witness calls us to, we, says, we have a message for the world. And so Jesus is saying here, go and make disciples of all nations. Well, disciples of whom? Of Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ himself was the one who showed us how to interpret the law and live by love. And, and they are to be baptized. And so again, it's very clear, according to this, this formula anyway, that the intention was that, that we would go out and bring others in and they would become part of us. So it's not a live and let live understanding of, of religion and evangelism and mission. And, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's that Trinitarian formula. And whether that was added later in Matthew's day or whether Jesus actually said that, we'll never know. But in the, in the Matthew as we have it now, that was a testimony of the early church, the first century church, at least in Matthew's view. And then it wasn't just about believing in Jesus and being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but also they were to obey everything that Jesus had taught. And so there is, oh, discipleship means obedience. And so you see there's many important components to, to the gospel mission here in these two verses that we should pay attention to. You have uh, a brief section on eschatology here on parousia and judgment. Um, and uh, I'll read it quickly. There's a harsh anticipation of judgment in Matthew. The Son of Man, who is Jesus, comes to gather the elect and bring judgment. Third, if righteousness is about action, judgment is logical and necessary. It's an incredible standard to meet, but at the same time, Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. We didn't read those verses, but that's also in Matthew. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. So our job, both as Christian, follow, Christians and followers of Jesus, and as interpreters of Matthew, is to understand how both statements can be true. How can we uphold this standard where Jesus says, you have to go beyond the law to be righteous, and at the same time preach that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. There must be some theological way to combine these in order to get a proper understanding of Jesus' message. 
There's no doctrine of justification in Matthew, but the kingdom is the work of God. Okay, finally, what's the applicability of Matthew's form of Christianity today? Uh, as we think about creating New Testament theology and moving from then to today, some Baptist or Mennonite group think the Sermon on the Mount can be lived out today. And so they still seek to live that, that out. Historically, Matthew's version of Christianity died out. So how should we interpret that? Is this a negative critique tr of trying to combine the law and the gospel? Or perhaps is it a passing of a certain transition stage in the birthing of a church? You see, so again we're asking when it comes to doing New Testament theology, at first we could say this is just what is in Matthew. Second stage is how does Matthew fit in with everything else? But a, a later stage, when we're talking about interpretation today, is now what do we do with it? Either we reconcile it to Paul and others, or we say this form is important historically, but it's not so important today. It's not how we're going to talk about the Christian faith. I, for one, rarely quote from Matthew, even though there's some very important verses uh, that I do quote. But as Matthew portrays his theology, I, I seldom find myself in a context that resembles early, Ju early Judaism or, or ancient Judaism in Jesus' day. Uh, but you're going to have to decide for yourself, I think. How is his theology, how does that fit with what you're going to teach and preach? The Protestants maintain that it's not possible to fulfill the law. And certainly not if it includes radical internal purity as Jesus required. Still, the Sermon on the Mount and Matthew's emphasis on a social gospel helps us to understand God's values in terms of mercy. Further, his emphasis on issues related to personal faith, active response to the gospel, and community life remind us that God intends that our faith impacts every area of our life. Again, righteousness is a way of life, according to Matthew. We are accountable for how we live. Okay, this ends our lectures on, on the Gospel of Matthew. Now for our class, it's time for you to think about what questions do you have as you wrestle with some of, his, of Matthew's theology and as you think about its relevance for your theology in your preaching and teaching today.